cineinc.com This is, this is her, um, an English woman who really was Indian. She took an Indian passport, she married an Indian, she dressed in Indian style even before she set foot on in Indian soil. So she was um, born in 1911 in Derby in the English Midlands, not from a privileged background. She got to Oxford and there in the early 1930s she met and fell in love with a fellow student, a Punjabi guy, uh, Baba Pyarelal Bedi, they were both left-wingers, they were both nationalists, and it was an insurgent romance which, of course, broke with social convention. They married, and then they spent a year in Berlin, of all places, you know, where Hitler was coming to power, and then she made her life in India, and they went to Lahore, settled there. She started working both teaching English and as a journalist. That was her main career as a journalist, and they became part of a rather gilded set of bohemian left-wing intellectuals, which included quite a few European and American women. She arrives in India in 1934, um, just as the Communist Party has been declared illegal, and as the temper of the nationalist movement after the failure of the roundtable conferences is gathering. So it's a period of activism and militancy, but also of suppression. The communist, if you were a member of the Communist Party, that was a problem. And she got involved in the new civil rights movement, which Nehru led. Her husband got very much involved in the Kisan movement, Kisan Sabha. And they were both uh, very active in bringing out both a rather highbrow quarterly review and then a distinctly lowbrow and activist weekly political newspaper in Lahore. So they were, they were really very active. <laughs> Her husband was repeatedly arrested as a communist activist. When war broke out, he tried to disrupt military recruitment in Punjab, and that was a big issue for the British authorities. So he was basically interned. He spent 15 months locked up in a camp in Rajasthan in the desert. She was outraged by this. She said he's been jailed for opposing fascism and opposing imperialism. I oppose fascism, I oppose imperialism. And she persuaded Gandhi uh, to let her become a Satyagrahi, so one of the people who courted arrest. So she said she was going to um, uh, repudiate the emergency wartime regulations and deliberately flout them. And just saying that she would do that was sufficient for her to be arrested. And she sent, spent uh, three months in 1941 in Lahore female jail. was born in Lahore in early 1946 um, and of all her three children well there was a fourth who died very young he was the one that was closest to her uh, when Frida became uh, uh, attracted to Buddhism uh, Kabir would go as a child to Burma with her and at one stage uh, became a, a novice monk for several months shaved his head wore the robes went out seeking alms and even later in life, after Frida died, she died in 1977, Kabir spent 12 years living in California and he uh, was active in New Age style religions and movements. I don't think he would describe himself as a Buddhist, but he would say that his spirituality is really a, an important part of his life and has largely been shaped by his parents and his mother in particular. attendant, um, Pema Zangmo, a Tibetan woman, who was with her when she died in 1977. So it was four years later, I was at um, Sherabling Monastery in Himachal Pradesh, building a retreat house, and Pema Zangmo was building a, you know, a nun's retreat, and for some reason she came over to me all the time and told me about uh, the passing of Mamila, 
whom she called Divine Mother or Holy Mother. And uh, I listened to this story and it was something I'd never heard before, that she had not um, shown any signs of um, a normal death, like she, her body didn't decay. She elaborated even more. She said there were there were lights, there were rainbows, there was. She made it rather glamorous in a way and um, full of um, miraculous signs, and um, she was convinced that Mummy had passed into uh, Nirvana, into an enlightened state. So I kept this in my mind. She was in uh, room 146 at the Oberoi Hotel in Delhi. Uh, a room that was always available to her thanks to her good friend Goody Oberoi, who was the wife of the hotel owner. It was the evening before the um, Buddhist conference was due to happen um, and she went into meditation as she usually did in the evening and when her attendant heard a cough, a, a sound from the room, she came into the room and she found that Frida was still was sitting in meditation, but she had, had passed away. She was gone. So then uh, some doctors came and uh, took blessing from her. Indian doctors took blessing from her. Uh, they, moved, they moved the body the next morning to their cousin's house in Nizamuddin, and uh, she was lying down and there was ice packed around the body. It was March in Delhi, it was very hot and um, there was still no, no sign of um, a normal, like a rotting situation or anything like that. So four days later, that she was cremated at uh, Goody Oberoi's farmhouse in Delhi and many, many, many monks and uh, I think Mrs. Mrs. Gandhi, Indira Gandhi, went to see the body while it was at the uh, cousin's house in Nizamuddin. Well, I think it's true that she had a good death. She died during an international Buddhist gathering in Delhi, which meant when she was cremated, there were Buddhist monks from many different countries who were present and chanting at the cremation. All the stories about her body remaining supple, uh, there's some stories about rainbows appearing at her cremation. I'm not a Buddhist. Um, I'm not a person of faith, to be honest. I respect faith, but I'm, I, I don't have a personal faith. I found these quite difficult, but the way I look at it is the people who tell these stories believe them. Do I believe that the rainbows appeared? I don't think it really matters. The people who tell them believe them, and they, they see those stories as a sign of great spirituality, holiness and reverence. And I would see them in that way. So I don't, you know, whether there were rainbows or not, the fact that people say there were rainbows is seen as conferring on Frida a, a really high spiritual renown and value. She was a columnist for a daily Indian paper on women's issues for a women's audience decades before this became commonplace. She was an English woman who uh, embraced Indian nationalism and went to jail for opposing a country which happened to be her mother country. She embraced not simply Tibetan Buddhism but became a Tibetan Buddhist nun and was really very important in helping Tibetan Buddhists adapt to exile in India and the West. All those are really quite remarkable achievements but I think it's that the, the sum of her life that interests me more than any particular aspect and the way that she reinvented herself without repudiating any aspect of her past. So even when she was a Tibetan Buddhist nun, when she came to London, she had lunch with her old friend Barbara Castle, then a Labour cabinet minister, at the Houses of Parliament and, and marched in there with her head shaved and her Buddhist maroon robes turning heads but quite oblivious to the fact that she was making that, that impact. Cineinc.com